Responsible consumption and production. Thirteen is climate action. Fourteen is life below water. Fifteen. And welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Eliane Balijaro, the Global Hub Director for Future Earth in Canada and the Executive Director of Sustainability in the Digital Age. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are located on unceded Indigenous lands. The Kanyakehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today, and Georgiaga, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the community. And we would like to recognize the importance of last week's National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, a day I spent in personal reflection. I have so much gratitude for this land and the generations of Indigenous peoples who have cared for this land for tens of thousands of years. Canada has been my home for 32 years. And in 1994, when my motherland of Rwanda experienced the genocide against the Tutsis, I was safely here. And I give thanks for all the opportunities I was given. As a global citizen, I recognize the hard work necessary for the path towards truth and recognition. And we look to continue this work. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our partner and the founder and CEO of the Canadian Science Policy Centre, Dr. Murdad Harari. 
Thank you, Eliane, for this uh, remarkable and touching words. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, first, I would like to acknowledge the lands that I'm talking to you from in Richmond Hill, Ontario, the traditional land and unceded territory of the Vinda, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe peoples, whose presence continues to this day. Uh, this acknowledgement is the very first step to reconciliation. I also would like to acknowledge the October 4th, uh, October 4th, which is marked as the National Day of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And uh, also last week, which was a remarkable week, as we had the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, a day of reflection and unlearning and learning uh, for many, me personally. Uh, I would like to take a moment also to extend my uh, a very well warm welcome to you all and thank you for attending the third town hall of the National Dialogue Series called Canada's Sustainable Future, Creating a Digital Action Plan. This series of online dialogue is hosted jointly by the Future Earth, Sustainability in the Digital Age, and the Canadian Science Policy Centre, and we'll look at how digital innovations can help Canada achieve the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. The knowledge and key findings developed during these dialogues will be presented to a larger science policy audience in November at the Canadian Science, uh, 13 Canadian Science Policy National Conference. And it is important to note that the Government of Canada has provided funding for this national dialogue series through their Sustainable Development Goals funding program, uh, their program moving forward together Canada's 2030 agenda national strategy is an important milestone in continuing to implement and advance the 2030 agenda. It supports progress on the sustainable development goals in Canada and abroad. We look forward to your participation and I hope you enjoy today's event. And if you have any questions for the panelists today, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we want to know what you think about this important topic. Merci beaucoup, Eliane, over to you. Thank you very much, Mordan. During the session, Alicia Bramlett, who is a graphic facilitator with DPECT, will use Miro board to capture the highlights of today's discussions and show us her work during the town hall. And it's a real honor to be introducing the topic for this, today's discussion, which is Indigenous Science and Knowledge Driving Transformative Solutions. One of the aims of this virtual series is to identify both the challenges and opportunities presented when we engage with digital technologies for sustainable targets. And it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's event, my dear colleague, Erin Dixon. Uh, thank you, Eliane. Um, Tanse, uh, Gisha Gate Indijnakaz, Ato Pamiziwak, Meiti Kweendao. Benesi Okanina Singh Donjaba. I am very grateful to be gathered um, in our collective, in our circle here from the waters, the sacred waters of Benesi Okanina Singh. The waters here are named in our, in our maps as Skeleton Lake, but it sits in a body of stories and much work we've been doing here locally to lift up uh, the spirit of the waters and of course the people here. I um, am calling from traditional Anishinaabe territory, so the Three Fires Confederacy of the Adawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe peoples. And we very close to me and many people I work with actually from Wata uh, Mohawk Nation, which is just across the waters, as well as many um, Métis regions and peoples gathered here today, all coming together as a collective in our change moving forward. And I want to thank you, Elian, um, for such powerful words opening us up grounding us on our responsibilities and all of our call here at this time. And I want to presence the power of your daughter, uh, Talia Malaika. Uh, she is the singer who sang in the Sustainable Development Goals. And in all of our teachings, we understand the nature of that change coming through and the power in the harmonics in which she brought uh, into, into the spirit of those goals, into that vision that we're moving towards collectively is very powerful, especially at our National Day of Action, 
when we still see images of many women across Turtle Island in Canada with a red hand over the mouth expressing that the voices still haven't been centered or heard. And to hear a young woman, as many as of our youth before COVID, talking about climate and planetary health and how we need to hear those voices in their full harmonic. And it's through that that we'll find our way through and our way forward. And so I'm very, very grateful uh, to be here with everyone uh, to be able to listen in together. And as I was uh, coming in, um, I, I had a, a dream about how to introduce such a powerful panel. Sometimes we talk about two-eyed seeing, but uh, when we come together in this forum, we can also imagine ourselves as a town hall and a community center and leaning into a table together, leaning in and listening in uh, to our community leaders. But I actually had a dream of us actually standing and being outside under trees near a river um, as, a, as the town hall, if you can imagine that. And all of our teachings, many of them, our trees are, of course, a, an expression of truth growing from the center of Mother, Mother Earth all the way up through the sky world. And when I think about the power of our panel, of our speakers and experts that we have here today, I, I invite everyone to imagine that vision as well as leaning into the truth that we need to listen into to center uh, in order to find our way through at this time. So thank you, Amurdad and Elian and all of the team here that have gathered to bring this opportunity together. I would love uh, to turn at this time um, to a matriarch that we have uh, the gift to, to have with us. Um, and she ha has actually brought her students as well with her, uh, Dr. Lorna Williams, to open up our dialogues officially um, in a good way. And we'll continue to open up our panel in the spirit of a circle as we move our panel forward today. Kukstum kau kika, wanosa in squa chicha, silk all it wet all as was in snook nook a lack with titimih and tamihua. The jauna shinwa titimihusha ilakwanana with a ihusanacha. Dot lock a amens plinus must echo la piljauna kamuchmin twatla. It's a it's a real honor for me. I introduced myself as wanosa. From the land of the the Litwat Ul, um, that is where my ancestors and all my relatives are. That's where my land is, and um, but I am speaking to you from the lands of the Lakwanan speaking people and the Huxanich. It's um, we gather today for a very to share our knowledge. To share our experiences and our wisdom for a very for a very huge topic, and um, and again, I ask you each of you to lend your voices to to shaping for the future for our for our children the way in which we have to we need to renew our relationships with one another across languages, across cultures, to renew and to strengthen our relationships in a good way with our relatives, the lands, the water, the air. I'm asking that each of you clear your negative energy as you come to this circle. And so that you, so that what we voice can help one another and can help us to know how to go about approaching a more just, equitable, and kind world. Thank you, Aaron. And so we'll welcome uh, Bob. Good morning, Sego, Ani, Bujo. Kanoshawake Megzi, Indigena Kas, Makwadotam. So, my name is uh, Taupine from the Bear Clan, and I'm really happy to be joined um, with all of you this afternoon. Also, want to express my appreciation to Eliane for her words at the beginning 
and for her leadership more generally uh, on so many issues. I'm wondering if she has like three or four clones because she's just so busy. But it's it's great to, to be with you and thank you, Aaron. Um, you know, I had a lot of things that I wanted to say by way of starting, but um, the last couple of days have kind of shook me up. The whole Facebook, um, Instagram, and targeting uh, girls and women in particular, and thinking about that in terms of digital world, and thinking about that in terms of safety, and thinking about some of the recommendations from the National Inquiry into murdering, murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, especially with respect to social media um, and media more generally. And, um, and, and I haven't landed anywhere except to think that one of the things that we need to be thinking about is really putting our children and those most vulnerable in our society, uh, Indigenous society in particular, women and girls, kind of at the center of how we're thinking about this relationship between sustainability, Indigenous knowledge, um, and, and the digital world more generally. Um, so th thanks for letting me get that off my chest. I, I wonder, what I wanted to say, sort of by way of, of uh, of positioning where I come at this from is to talk a little bit about the Dish with One Spoon, which is a, a well-known treaty in this part of Canada, Central Canada. And I remember talking to an elder from Ganawagi about this. And I sort of explained my view on this about sort of sharing resources, in particular between the Haudenosaunee people and the Anishinaabek. And he said, yeah, yeah, that's kind of it, Bob, but it's really a, a global economic model. <laughs> I said, well, that's a little bit more than what I was talking about. And then I said, can, can you tell me more? He said, yeah, the dish with one spoon really speaks to the dish is the world. And um, all the resources in the world are represented by that dish. And that spoon talks about how do we share resources? Um, how uh, what is the methods we're going to sort through in terms of the wise dis distribution of resources? What kind of characteristics? Who's going to hold the spoon? Because clearly everybody can't. So how do we do that? And what are the characteristics that we're looking for in terms of either people or institutions that would hold that spoon? And thinking about things like love and kindness and caring and humility and all of those things that we would want in terms of a good leader and a good steward when we're talking about wise distribution of resources. And then that need for, as we're making decisions for that, about that dish and about the utilization of that spoon, we're thinking ahead seven generations. So how can we not just take care and sustain ourselves, but how can we ensure sustainability for future generations? And, um, and then he said, and then there's the dish itself. He said, uh, the dish has rights, the dish is Mother Earth, the dish has agency. So how do we take the Mother Earth's agency into account in terms of how we utilize the, the spoon for the wise distribution of resources for both this generation that are, uh, are alive now and those coming faces? And, and just thinking about all the attributes and um, values and principles that are going to guide all of that. And I've actually tried to do that actually with in trainings where I've done it. So like, just pretend like here's a group of four of you, like, how are you going to decide how to use that spoon? And, and it's hard to do. So just imagining how we would be able to do that uh, on a global scale, um, acting locally to ensure that there's local benefit to whatever's being done, but also thinking about our, our, our relatives all around the world and significantly our relatives, which are the world the mineral world, plant world, and animal kingdom. So I just wanted to offer that, Aaron, by way of, uh, of starting off, and thank you for this opportunity. Oh, beautiful. Now, miigwech, Bob. Thank you for that. I uh, definitely, when I was listening yesterday, I was just, you know, really present with the reasons why we are here um, in how you began us off around the systemic racism and what is reflected back. And... Uh, 
both the urgency and the agency that we need when we have the opportunity to listen into conversations and come together to move ourselves, allow ourselves to be moved into action and responsibility. So thank you both for that centering and also for the teaching and starting us off. I live in the dish with one spoon. So I've had at different times been able to hear uh, some of the different teachings around the local wampums here, both the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee wampums. Uh, so very grateful that we can center ourselves around that. I wanted to welcome the panel, um, if that's okay, for everyone to turn on their cam uh, cameras at this time. Even as we move around and introduce ourselves, I think it would be nice to see our full circle and uh, community. Of course, if you need to, you're welcome to turn it off as you, as you need to move. But we'll continue uh, our circle here and I'll welcome you, uh, Jocelyn, you're just under Bob here in my screen. Welcome. Hi, Gwyneth Chish Aaron, and uh, hello everybody. ING Dak Alama Uye, Kwanlin Ninje, Agunda Iche. My name is Jocelyn Jo Strack, or Dak Alama, which means white spot mother. I'm a member of the Champagne and Ajak First Nation of uh, the Southwest Yukon, and uh, a member of the Wolf Clan. And so I was born and raised here in Whitehorse um, and around in Haines Junction. And now I'm the Indigenous Knowledge Research Chair at our new Yukon University here. Uh, my background is in biochemistry and microbiology, uh, but now I, I work a lot with young people. And so I've journeyed through land planning and policy and hydrology, but really found, I think, that my, my path is bringing me to, to education and to thinking about how to hold up our young people as they move forward in this, this challenging and convoluted world. So thinking about um, the digital age and technology, certainly I hear a lot about anxiety and um, how social media really pulls young minds away from, from the world and reality. It creates a lot of questions and uncertainties. But in moving forward, you know, it also creates a lot of connection and opportunity to share and to communicate. And so I, I can appreciate the need for this dialogue as we, as we search for that balance between our, our health and well-being and ensuring that our time together um, and, and our innovations like serve us in a good way. Um, for myself, like I, I even can, can, can think about how how social media can, can pull you away a little bit, but can also help to share your message. Like I've recently uh, joined TikTok because <laughs> I'm trying to be cool like the kids. <laughs> and um, I'm proud to say, I think my TikToks are doing okay. I've got like, like 5,000 or so followers and I felt kind of proud of that. <clears throat> and then just this past weekend, I was out on the land and, uh, with, with quite a few young, young, young people. So in that like 13 and I was trying to be cool and I was like, I'm on TikTok. And uh, the one young girl, she's like, oh yeah. She's like, well, I've got like 10,000 followers, <laughs> like plus. And I was like, oh, I was like, well, I have 5,000. And she's like, oh, that's pretty good. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, <laughs> I felt so proud of myself. But um you know, I, I think it's exciting, all of these new ways to share. And it's nice to be on there to set a role model, knowing that the 13-year-olds are there too. Um, so it's more than just uh, the common ways of, of sharing yourself on, on social media, but then finding the ways to, to share knowledge and, and hope and, and a bit of love. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm very honored to be here and to be sharing the panel with um, my fellow panelists here. It's, it's truly, truly an honor and I look forward to getting to know you all better. Thank you, Jocelyn. And welcome, Cody, I have you next to Jocelyn here. Thank you, Cody Daibo Yujets. My title uh, is Radzahayas, or in other words, uh, elected band council. So yes, I am, <laughs> uh, you can say part of that system, uh, although uh, I don't feel like I am sort of that system per se, uh, currently right now, you know, with indigenous communities, uh, the, the elected band system is sort of the recognized, um, we'll say government uh, for the territories. 
Uh, so that's my chance at trying to better my community. Um, a little bit about myself, I'm 32 years old. Uh, I'm a former police officer as well in Kahnawake. Um, I have a beautiful four-year-old daughter. Um, and really a lot of things that are pushing me are, are for her. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to change the world. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, let's be honest, the world is quite a big place. Uh, so I focused it down more onto her world. Uh, and it's evident, you know, in the recent, uh, the recent two years, uh, her world may be very different or is going to be very different than the world I grew up in. Uh, and I mean, I know I'm only 32, so it's not as if I've been around the block uh, too long, but um, it is quite different, you know, especially, you know, we were talking about uh, social media. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, there was no, uh, or internet was dial up. Uh, so uh, there was nothing uh, expedient about that. Um, so a lot of my focus in my community right now is just trying to uh, figure a better way forward uh, and not uh, similar to the one dish, one spoon, uh, similar to, you know, with our resources and sustainability long term, and how are we going to navigate, you know, a growing population, um, climate change, food shortages, droughts, uh, how are we supposed to survive as a people, uh, my community, our communities. Uh, so really looking at internally how we can begin uh, sort of this next step and not saying going back, but uh, I mean, indigenous people, uh, we were here long before uh, Europeans. We thrive long before Europeans, uh, you know, because we used what was on the land, what was given to us and in what we needed, not what we wanted. Uh, and I think we need to start looking back, going to that way, um, sort of cutting down the excess use of things um, because it is about the, the future generations, you know, and that's something that I was able to see when I had a daughter of my own, um, you know, <laughs> how, how am I going to do things or what am I going to do that's going to affect her? Uh, and again, like I said, I think it's, it's important that we focus small um, instead of thinking big that we're going to change the world overnight. Uh, but how are we going to change somebody's will? And for me, it's, it's my daughter. So Yamagoa, uh, I'm glad to be here. And um, thank you. Nawagoa Cody. And uh, I do have Jessica uh, just to your, your next, and we'll close uh, our opening circle with Ken uh, on the East Coast. Uh, I guess you're in BC, but <laughs> we're carrying some of that, uh, some of the gifts from the Eastern waters. Welcome, Jessica. They're just a guata yajats, yajahayas, ne rati jahayas, ne gahnawage. Um, Wax Karewa again, you will get the Roda, Wagatanuni, Tiga Igas. So, hello everybody, welcome to today and welcome to this session. I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> um, my Ganya Geha name, my Mohawk name is Jess uh, Deo Justokwate, but I allowed the use of my Jarhasa English name Jessica. Yet Zahayas is the title I prefer rather than chief. Uh, in the Mohawk Council of Gahnawake, it means that I'm minding the fire. So as Cody alluded to that, um, we do have to kind of work within the framework of the Indian Act because right now we have no alternative. But right now within our organization at, in Gahnawake, we are trying to move through to get a more traditional and a little bit more ownership with these titles and within our jobs and how we relate to our community members. Um, I am Bear Clan. I have two sons. Uh, one is eight and one is four. <laughs> and they are my reason for being here. I guess similar to Cody that I really want to make my community a better place for them to grow up in. Um, I started my, I guess, my interest in the community because obviously as a teenager, sometimes you just don't really care about anybody else but yourself. <laughs> So um, when I was 19 years old, I had opened up a restaurant in, uh, in Gahnawage called the Coffee Cup Cafe. And in this restaurant were a really um, a solid customer base of elders. And they would sit from seven o'clock till 10 o'clock in the morning, just kind of 
gossiping, telling stories about their days past and their experiences of growing up and their experiences of, um, I guess, dealing with the different situations that Kahnawake has gone through throughout our history, which is, I'm not going to kid around, it's a very extensive and very intensive history. It's very, um, there's a lot of things that had gone on throughout our, I guess, time being here on this specific territory. And as the uh, band council evolved, as different organizations have evolved, we've come a very, very long way from the so-called Indian Act enacted band council. And I'm very, very proud to say that because our community has come so far and this organization, as well as the other organizations in our community have come so far. We have a few schools in our community that were initiated in order to kind of take back our culture and our language and to revitalize a lot of that knowledge within our youth. And that's one of my main focuses uh, as the um, Adzahayas. At the same time, I'm an ambassador of hope for the We Matter organization, which addresses Indigenous youth suicide all across Canada. And we work towards culture-based approaches to um, addressing that very, very serious issue. So I just want to say thank you, everybody, for having me here today. I'm very honored and I'm very humbled. I've looked at all of the bios of the other panelists, <laughs> and I am quite impressed at all of my brothers and my sisters across this Turtle Island and how much we've accomplished and how much we've, how far we've come all together or at once or in our own paths, ways. <laughs> now I'll go. Now we'll go Jessica. Grateful you could be with us. And we'll welcome Ken. Uh, my name is Ken Paul. I'm a member of the Wollastook Way Nation. Um, physically, my com community, the Good Cook, is uh, Tobik First Nation located in northern New Brunswick. Um, physically, today, I'm actually in the traditional territory of the Shealis uh, out in the West Coast. I'm here supporting some people who are very close to me because they recently lost a family member. Um, but my work primarily uh, with, within my nation uh, revolves around Wollastook, which People will know as the St. John River, but we know Wollastook as the traditional name is the beautiful and bountiful river. And um, we actually name ourselves after that river as Wollastook Yig, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river. We have our creation stories all based upon that river system, which empties into the Bay of Fundy, but it pulls up through the province of New Brunswick, the province of Quebec and the state of Maine. So of course, when they drew these borders, they didn't really talk to us about that. They just did that on our behalf. Um, in our nation, the Wolostoki, we're actually part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, which includes the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy, the Penobscot, and the Abenaki. And we are the keepers of the Dawn lands. We are the, we are the people within Turtle Island, North America, that sees the first light of when the sun rises. And we are also uh, the gateway from which the Europeans uh, that came across uh, the Atlantic Ocean, the big waters, they came to our lands first. We signed treaties with the visitors, with the British crown uh, starting back in 1724-25, with that continue today. And the disputes that you may see in the media uh, regarding um, Sebaganegadi and the lobster um, out in St. Mary's Bay, in Sonyaville in Nova Scotia, we are all part of that same treaty beneficiary group. Um, with respect to the sustainable development goals and generally the environmental goals, the approach that I take and the primary role that I'm serving right now for my nation is trying to heal the, the Wollastook, and which means trying to bring back our fisheries in abundance. We have problems with um, the, the populations of Atlantic salmon. Uh, we have problems with populations of uh, American eel or elvers, and we know that a lot of these um, problems that are happening with our river system um, have been perpetuated over the years because of hydroelectric development, 
um, lack of uh, sanitation towards municipalities, um, pesticides coming from farming practices, um, spraying and um, I guess unethical forestry practices. And we know that the treaties that our ancestors signed over 250 years ago were done under ceremony, they were done under debates, but they were done so that we can enjoy that recognition as a nation today. So what we do when we look at our river system, we see that as part of ourselves. Our ancestors were buried within this watershed. So the blood of our ancestors literally run through our traditional territories. And if we can heal the river, we can start healing all the nations and all the peoples that live within the territory. So it, it's sort of a simple concept, but it's very, very complex because a lot of people have different understandings of what they should be doing in the Canadian economy. Um, people are always afraid of job loss. Uh, they're afraid of uh, being displaced and being disempowered. But the strength of our communities come from our community elders, uh, especially the women who have that role of taking care of the waters. And so that's primarily who I take direction from. I work uh, with not only my uh, First Nation community, but with all of the nations as well. And um, I know it's going to be a long haul, but as long as we're continuing to contribute to the healing of our territory, I believe that we will start contributing to the global crisis around climate change. We know that we can only work locally and impact locally when we do this work, but if we make our contribution and support others as they're making their contributions, we feel that we, we do have hope for the future generations. So that's sort of where I, that's where I sit, I guess, in this, uh, in this panel. Which thank you, Ken, for all of those teachings and for everyone here. I'm so grateful and just a, a natural reflection out to our larger community here. Uh, it's so powerful to have an intergenerational dialogue. And I, I hope that uh, you continue to have these conversations as you move out uh, from today. But we wanted to open up and have a look um, at our virtual town hall and give our community an opportunity just to see where everyone is coming from um, and maybe the if you know the uh, the languages, um, the land or the territory, um, just welcome you. We have a, a little poll to go out just so we can have a reflection back. Uh, we know that we're we're beyond what we see here. Um, yeah, I, I um, I'm always brought back with these bigger conversations. Um, I've had many different um, elders as we have here. Dyla Huell, I can hear her speaking, and she said. Aaron, when we were able to walk with the spirit of vision in the stories of our prophecies, as well as, in the other hand, take care of things that were right in front of us, but to be able to expand uh, some of that time and space and to hold that vision while we walked and took care of things, we walk with resilience and power. And I, I think uh, just for everyone listening in, I welcome, welcome you to listen into the wisdom of the circle itself. Uh, some of what has already emerged in the introductions are very, very foundational recommend recommendations um, from some of the reports that I know that uh, Dr. Lorna Williams held within the uh, Indigenous Circle on Open Science and the decolonization of knowledge around Indigenous knowledge as science, but looking at time and space, looking at the foundation of culture. There were key recommendations there that you can hear reflected in our community, um, as well as, you know, understanding um, I think Jessica talked about listening to elders, having that dialogue going in the coffee shop. We can hear the wisdom of what's reflected here, of what's important, and that we can't talk about sustainable development goals if we're not holding the commissions, if we're not holding UNDRIP and all of the other frameworks like a basket together, all of the justice frameworks uh, that can move us forward. So just wanted to reflect um, that with the wisdom of the opening there and invite um, our community to listen deeply as we share. Um, what what will emerge here today? So thank you, um, everyone. And uh, I know I'm just going to open up here to see. There we are. So it looks like uh, we have actually a, a beautiful weave uh, between um, a nonprofit as we have um, 
guided here, academic, government, and uh, a little bit smaller on the business, but we have uh, quite a nice balance across, uh, I know our community, we have so many community leaders and change uh, agents here. And so we have uh, about a quarter uh, from British Columbia, Alberta. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and it looks like the majority from Ontario and Quebec. Mm -hmm. And we did want to ask if people knew the languages, uh, the territories and treaties where they were located. And we have 73% people saying they do. They have some connection with 30% um, not uh, having that relationship. And we have about 10% uh, saying they don't have any understanding of Indigenous science and knowledge and about 80% at a basic uh, understanding. So we're so grateful for all of the guidance here. and. Thank you for uh, helping me there as I as I opened up the uh, technology to kind of reflect back who we are. But it it's a, it's really important um, as we come together to acknowledge the waters um, as Ken did uh, of where we come from of who we are. Um, so please take some time if you haven't visited. Uh, we're on native land uh, web web link to continue to build relationships with the languages, the people, and of course the uh, the territories and treaties. Um, so we're going to continue uh, to open up the spirit of our, our circle here and uh, some of the, the seeds and reflections, both in questions and areas of focus, some of our, our uh, community leaders and experts have shared with us to guide our conversations today because we did want it to be guided uh, from community. And Bob, you did such a beautiful job um, opening us up with the teaching with some of our original agreements that we know exist across Turtle Island, the dish with one spoon. Um, Treaty. Is there anything else that you would like to reflect on how our teachings and our thoughts uh, can guide sustainability in the digital, the digital world? I know we opened it up, but I wanted to return to that as we began again. Yeah, thanks, Aaron, and thanks uh, to all the other panel members. Just uh, some really, really uh, wonderful thoughts and ideas that have been shared so far. I'm sitting here as a learner and just learning tons. One of the other things I've been thinking about is kind of that just the power of the circle and, and what that circle means in terms of relationship uh, with each other, of notions of equity and equality and uh, collectivity and kind of that power of saying uh, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. I just think there's a power in that in and of itself versus what can I get for myself or how can I accumulate as much as possible at the expense of others or at the expense of um, the circle more, more uh, generally. And just thinking that, you know, as we've gone through this evolution since contact in terms of our relationship with each other, as Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, that this, this um, matter of power and privilege has, um, it's become a currency. And, and that currency, part of an economy, isn't generally shared with, with, with Indigenous people. Um, and so just thinking about what, what that means in terms of relationship between individual and, and, and collectivity, I just so appreciate the words from panelists that really talked about, um, about local. One of the elders I was talking to before I came here, he said, the, the thing you need to keep asking yourself throughout your time together, and maybe just more generally for your life, is how will this be a benefit in my community? And how will this be a benefit to my grandchildren and to my great grandchildren. And that's really the lens or that's the measuring instrument in terms of how we're doing with respect to the, that relationship between sustainability and the digital world or the digital economy. And, and, and I agree with that like we shouldn't be afraid of those things that so many of those innovations and inventions when they've come into our community, we've found ways oftentimes of making them indigenous. We found ways of making them indigenous, whether it's radio or TV or the internet now, 
Um, and, and maybe to the extent that we can make this digital world that we're surrounded by more and more indigenous, it will be a more of greater benefit to, to, to all of us. It'll be kind of blockchain like. We can all benefit from that and we can all converse and trade with each other even if we don't need know each other. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've uh, through some of the preparations, we've actually come to know some of Jason Lewis's work on Indigenous AI. Some beautiful work happening and people gathered across Mother Earth around how do we bring, um, how do we do that? <laughs> and uh, starting to actualize it and make those pathways. Um, Lorna, I wanted to turn to you next. You. Uh, you sent such a powerful reflection and question, and I think it's uh, something many gathered here today really want to lean into and, and understand is how Canadians and Canada together can work uh, collaboratively uh, with Indigenous peoples to shift uh, the colonial policies. As we talked about all of the habits, the systemic racisms, the structures and practices that were originally established uh, to suppress and control Indigenous peoples. Um, I think, you know, speaking into the spirit of the circle and our original agreements that lift us up and guide our, uh, of how we can walk together are essential, but I would uh, love to invite you to reflect on that and we'll open that up as well to our, our circle of panelists. Well, <clears throat> I think that it's only been very recently that um, the general Canadian public is beginning to um, is beginning to see the place where they are within this colonial structure that we call Canada, and um, you know, with the you know, with the um, the murdered and missing woman, and the actions that have been taking place, the teaching that women are 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 giving to the general public, and. In, and most recently, he, hearing the way that um, the leaders of Quebec are responding to Joyce Echequan, the report on Joyce Echequan's passing, I think really reveals where where can, can, Canadians are. And so even though they say in Quebec that 65% believe that there's systemic racism, but... Um, in, um, it's still, we're still in a place where Canadians are struggling to own, to acknowledge their, that they've benefited from a very, very inequitable structure that they've put into place in which indigenous knowledge has been made invisible it's been denigrated. It's been we've been dehumanized, and and that is that permeates every institution in this country. And I have to say that um, although digitization and technology, yes, can bring us things, and we are doing. Um, making it our own and struggling to do that. But if you look at that field, for example, it's a really good uh, example. It's based on a Euro Western paradigm. It's based on a Euro Western train of thought. It's based on a Euro Western organization of, of, um, of values and ways of being. And we, we have to be careful that we, that we don't continue to support that. And so, you know, we have a huge job to address that. And um, one of the areas that's really, um, you know, that's uh, for, you know, just, to, I just want to give you an example. Most of the languages in this country cannot, cannot be written using the technology that's been created. 
But what did First Peoples, First Voices at First Peoples Culture Council do? They created, they created keyboards for every language in this country, including syllabics. For every language that wants it in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand. Indigenous people had to do that. Technology didn't. And so we need to we need to be careful. We also need to be careful about how our knowledge systems can become distorted, abused, taken through the, the digital systems. So what are we going to do to protect that? To make sure that um, to make sure that our way of being in the world, our knowledge systems are not degraded and distorted, continue to be degraded and distorted. When you think about in each of your territories, how did people come to know what plants to use for what? They did it in ceremony. They did, they did it using all of their senses. It cannot be reduced which is what science does. It's a reductionist system. And so it's important that these circles happen and that the voices of indigenous people are heard. It's also, I know that it's time consuming, it's hard, but we have to reach a place where we work, where we can walk together for the common good of our communities, our families, and the earth. And it's, and we have to recognize the inequities in, in our, in our institutions, where we learn. When you look at education, from the earliest times in you know, kindergarten, all the way through, through to academic levels. Those are all based on Euro Western thought systems and values. Where is there an opportunity for people to learn about who we are on our lands? That hasn't happened yet. Education continues to be a closed system that favors one part of our, our society that needs to change. We can only do that by talking with one another, working together, being open to one another, being willing to listen to one another. And I'm talking here mainly to the non-Indigenous people because I think indigenous people have been very open to hearing and listening and working together. That's a part of who we are and we cannot lose that. Even though throughout these educational systems, we've been taught to not behave in that way. We need to continue to hold on to that and to know and to value our knowledge systems, our way of governing, our way of caring for each other, our way of caring for the earth, the way that we learn together, we need to continue, we need to continue to practice those and to build them into the ways in which we govern ourselves, in which we help each other, and which we, in which we take care of the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Sometimes uh, I feel like we could leave a few minutes of space and reflection, uh, you know, after we speak sometimes. But I, uh, yeah, I feel, um, I feel there's so many different, uh, different aspects to be held at the same time. I know when we first spoke, you said this is so big, there's so many different parts. 
and in the spirit of the work you did around the the open science and the decolonization of knowledge i think the last principle in the recommendation was opening up time and space so this idea of time and moving quickly uh, but to actually when you said we need to slow down to listen to each other but we understand uh, as we slow down, uh, we actually, there's so many people that say we actually go f faster and we expand collectively and we move together in that unity uh, when we slow down. And so this concept of time and space and how it's held is actually uh, one of, you know, it's, it's right at the center of much of what you say because we do have the, the intelligence, the capacity to hold everything if we move out of more of an industrial market-based time and space relationship into our cosmic center of who we are and, and the power that we hold together. So thank you for, for grounding us um, in that reflection. And I wanted to open it up to the, the panelists in our circle here. If there's any reflections, please, Cody, I see your hand there. Uh, Nyawa, uh, Lorna, for those words. And, uh, you know, it, it made me reflect too, you know, we, a lot of it is, uh, you know, with education, uh, you know, um, I grew up in Ganawage, uh, and we have our own school systems, uh, elementary and high school. However, I went to um, a high school in uh, the Montreal area, in down uh, not downtown Montreal, but uh, more NDG area. And speaking of education, you know, and talking about systemic racism, you know, you don't have to blatantly say, you know, uh, or, or call out the racism. It's the things that are done in there that show the racism where Iroquois people who played a vital role uh, in the Montreal area uh, and early um, New England and New France and Dutch um, sort of colonial expansion into the new world, I believe it was a day. I, it was only 17, well, I say only 17 years ago when I was in high school learning about it, but a day to learn about Iroquois and then a day to learn about Algonquin. Um, so talking about, you know, people not being able to understand or have access to the education, it, it's from those systems where the curriculum needs to be expanded and not just, you know, from a textbook that was written, designed by the system, but by people who, um, who have actual knowledge in it. And I was fortunate to have a, a teacher who, um, I guess we can say was, um, uh, more sensitive uh, to to our his our history, and uh, he ended up stretching it over two weeks. Which still, I mean, you know, to try to cram all our histories into two weeks is not much, but it's better than the two days that they were originally uh, allotted for. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, going forward, I, I think it, it's really important, and we're seeing it around the world. Not even uh, not only just in Can uh, Canada, but in the United States. You know, the whole talks about. Uh, in the southern states about um, with slavery and wanting to change the education system. And there's such a pushback because I think in general, people are, you shouldn't feel ashamed for what happened in the past. It's from the past that we know what to do in the future and to learn from it. Uh, so it's important to know all of human history, the good, the bad, uh, the great, the ugly, um, you know, at one point I knew more about ancient Rome than I did about my own culture. Uh, you know, so it kind of says, you know, well, even still in Canada and North America, you know, well, we're learning about uh, ancient civilizations, you know, and your dedicated entire, um, not terms, but um, not even semesters, but sections uh, just on ancient civilizations, you know, uh, and then you hear about all their good and bad and the ugly, but you know, when you get to a certain point, it's, well, let's not relive, you know, the, the atrocities that happened. Uh, so let's try to brush it under the rug to make it seem like nothing happened. But the first step, I think, into recognizing it is, in, is acknowledging that there was, you know, ethnic genocide that took place. Uh, and, you know, uh, maybe not intentional, but it continues even until the recent past, you know, we, we talked about the, the original 215 that were discovered. Uh, from the residential schools, um, you know, when did residential schools finally close? You know, it's not too far uh, in the past to say this was hundreds of years ago. But the first step, I think, uh, is that acknowledgement. And uh, I mean, the other governments right now, provincial, like Quebec especially, shouldn't be scared to acknowledge it. You know, acknowledging is the first step into uh, admitting there's a problem and uh, healing.
Uh, now I'll go with Cody. I am um, just a quick reflection back. I had the opportunity to hear Paulette Fox speak. She's doing some beautiful work around biocultural markers and justice frameworks. And she said with she educates at the same time. She's she's kind of doing everything, educating, um, looking at the biocultural markers from her language. She's a, a beautiful Blackfoot uh, elder and knowledge keepers doing all of those things together, really um, having a, a touch point on what's needed to move everything forward. So thank you for for centering that. Uh, Jessica, I see your hand as well. And and of course, Jocelyn, we'll have you after. Butch. So Nyawakoa, Lorna, for all of those words, I nearly, <laughs> nearly cried. It took a lot <laughs> to not cry. <laughs> Um, I'm a very emotional person, so, <laughs> and yeah, um, I wanted to correct myself. I'm not sure if I said it was three schools within our community because there are more, but I know that we started with three and that more came along in the way uh, during our history. And when it comes to thinking of our past generations and our future generations, the way that we see it is the seven generations before us and the seven generations in front of us. And that's how I try to ground myself in the work that I do in terms of community development and trying to ensure that our community comes out on, on top and trying to make sure that we don't fall behind in any way, shape or form. And as for education, um, I recently actually just completed two years only of an undergraduate bachelor's degree in public policy at one of the universities in Montreal. And I had left my studies to for the role that I have now. But there was so much that I've learned, not just about, I guess, um, Indigenous peoples, but also the way that uh, non-Indigenous folks have related to us and the questions that are being asked still to this day. And I was in disbelief that uh, from when I was in grade seven to when I was in university that the same questions were being asked. If I took a canoe to school, if I lived in a teepee and there's a, a huge disconnection to the reality and the truth of who we are in this, this on this land. And as for what, um, Cody was alluding to for acknowledging as being the first step, I think it is definitely a really, really essential core step to trying to get this truth out of the reconciliation. And it's towards opening up our minds. So if we acknowledge and if everyone acknowledges the truth, I've seen one of the questions um, and the question saying, how can Euro Western people learn to see themselves from outside of their own points of view? I think the answer to that was to be open and acknowledge the hard truth and have these, these kind of discussions in different spaces as uncomfortable as it is, because this is what Indigenous people live through every single day and every single moment. It weighs on our minds, these realities, these truths, our histories, the, uh, I, I can go on and on about what we live through every single day. So when it comes to trying to open up your mind is the first step is acknowledging that, is acknowledging the real history and doing the work yourself and not leaving it up to Indigenous peoples to do all the work because <laughs> we're tired. <laughs> and mind you, I'm only 28 years old and it's it's an exhausting um, it's an exhausting experience to be indigenous. I'm not going to lie, but it's worth it because our people are worth it. Our knowledge is worth it. It's so tied into how we move about in this world and how the way that sustainability and development will move forward. A, a lot of that knowledge is like core and essential to that and we have to revitalize that and we have to acknowledge that as well as the pain and the the, the I don't want to <laughs> have no words as well as the pain it's all, all of the knowledge all of the experiences and that's what I want to bring today is the importance of our storytelling and the importance of sharing our experiences because we all are the same but we all have different journeys and different paths along this timeline. And what I've learned from learning my own Ganyagaha language is that 
the space-time continuum is not the same for Europeans or Euro-Western mindset as it is for Indigenous peoples, and that even within our language, at least for Ganyagaha, that it's incorporated and ingrained in there in a way where we really see um, a video of what we're talking about and not just a picture. And it's so, um, the detail that's within our language when we just speak it is so deep and so wide that it's very, very hard to transition from um, this traditional and Western, I'm just starting to ramble, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just, I feel so passionate and like hearing everybody's words and having to hear their stories and experiences and I'm overwhelmed right now a little bit. But I'm try I guess I was trying to allude to like two world see two wide seeing that indigenous people do that already, but it's also important for non-indigenous people to attempt to try to see those two different worlds and under, to understand where we're coming from and to understand how we ground ourselves and our knowledge and our, our culture and our language, which is basically all the same and <laughs> one and the same. Okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> well, now I'll go with Jessica. I really appreciate uh, the spirit and uh, the wisdom that you bring. I know Jocelyn, when she uh, she actually responded to our larger team, she reflected on, you know, the focus on um, spirituality, heart and experience in our work and how we lift up our knowledge. So, yeah, thank you for shining um, in some of uh, Jocelyn's reflections as you spoke there. We're so grateful. And Jocelyn, welcome you uh, to reflect. Yes, goodness, cheers, goodness, cheers, everybody. It is a very meaningful and, and important conversation. Thinking about history, uh, that's where a lot of my reflections come back to, uh, and that difference between the like, Indigenous and, and Western history. Uh, within uh, part of the challenge with the education system in, in not telling our history is that it is quite long and deep, and it's held within our stories and our language. In the land. And so it it's becomes not a, a mental, mental memory knowledge based exercise, but coming to know your history is a, an exercise in coming to understand your identity and purpose on this land. And so it's not just about what has happened, but how what has happened has led to, to your place and then an understanding of your place moving forward for what is to come in the future generations. I think a lot like about, we have a story here in the Yukon, uh, in my own First Nation actually, um, where there was, a, uh, there was a second winter. So there was, it snowed again in, in June, which normally is when the, the animals are born, like the leaves come out, but it's typically like one of the hotter times of year, uh, but it snowed in like the mid 1800s. And the people starved, all of the animals died and they couldn't find anything. And then uh, there was like great perseverance and endurance. And there was one, one man, um, Gitzada, and he, he like tied sticks to his legs and he went on when nobody else could. And he was standing there with his, his bow and arrow like at the ready to shoot a, a squirrel. He had found a squirrel's nest. And as he was sitting there in the snow, just patient, all of a sudden he heard a crack out of this, like from the side and he looked over and there was a cow moose. And she had come over and she was, had all of her eyes on the squirrels, like mushroom cache up in the tree. And like, she didn't even see, see Gitsada. And so he, he slowly moved. And just as the, the cow like reached up to get the mushroom cache, he, he shot her. And uh, with great perseverance, he managed to bring broth. He, they couldn't eat, right? They, they just had to drink broth until they were strong enough. And he took the guts, he took the bum guts. Um, that's all he took at first to make the, 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 the broth. And he brought it to like, all of our people. And um, over time, they, they, they shared that moose. They made that moose go as far as possible to bring people through until the sun came back. That's important history though, because like he saved us. 
I wouldn't be here if he didn't do that. And that is history that is largely unknown. That's not taught in our schools. You know, instead we're taught about like war heroes or, or Western political figures and, um, or like, you know, Roman, Roman Caesar. But this person who like directly saved us is, is largely unknown. And then the history goes even deeper in terms of, of heroes. Like we have Atsuya, Asuya is a smart beaver man, and he traveled up the river. And there's different ideas about which river, if that was the Mackenzie River, the Yukon River. But he traveled up and he, he killed all of the big animals that used to eat people. Right? And there's thoughts those could be the animals of the Ice Age. And so our, our memory, our stories go back to the Ice Age, whereas in the Western way, our knowing of the Ice Age is based on science and what has been on Earth and what could be imagined based on the knowledge that they have created. Um, but we actually have stories that can tell us that was, what had happened there. And then that relationship and that evolution of the story and how people related to the land also endures. And so when we look at how we live with the land now, and if you're to know that history and be able to speak to the language, like now the swans are flying overhead, you say, Nanuchishi, like safe travels, we'll miss you, like we'll see you in the springtime, or they talk to them. And instead, you know, in the science way, they just sort of measure how many go over without even acknowledging their being. So there's so, so much to learn. I do believe like thinking about the digital age, like education and like the knowledge that is to be shared in terms of history and identity is, is incredibly important. And I think important for the non-Indigenous like nations or like peoples as well to really understand how deep that history goes and like how, how entrenched we truly are, people evolved with and of the land. And, uh, you know, you say you're people of the river, like here we say we are part of the land, part of the water. We are not, we are not outside of earth and all of its beings, you know, we are a deep entrenched part of it and our actions are felt by earth, more so now that we've lost our way and that we're walking in balance and in misstep. And, you know, in, in, the, in my teachings, um, you can be very conscious of when you're walking in a good way or what, if you're in misstep. And when you're, when you're not walking in a good way, often there are many, many signs to tell you so. Things don't work out. You know, your, your computer can crash, your car can shut down, your, you can stub your toe. Or sometimes I swear somebody goes like this and shoves my hand into the door, like, tell me to smarten up. And um, we've just really lost our our ability to, to be conscious of those signs. And we keep trying to push and force things through despite all of that is telling us that we're on the wrong path. The confidence of walking in a good way, walking a good path is just a wonderful thing. Something that all of our young people deserve. And instead we're trying to force them through this path where they you know, are continuously gonna be like fat in their heads and, and just frustrated. But I think the teachings and the stories like teach this way of self-confidence and knowing um, that is based on like respect and honor and integrity and just making conscious decisions that are, are born out of the heart, guided by spirituality, and then, you know, rationed with your mind as well. But in this mind-dominated society that neglects heart and spirit, this is the path that we find ourselves on. And I do believe that it is Indigenous people that will bring that return of heart and spirit and that there's so much to be like look forward to and it, and it does come with the knowing of, of the history and the language and returning to the land. This teaching. <laughs> Beautiful, to me, Gwetch, Jocelyn. And uh, I'll welcome you, Cody. Uh, maybe we'll close this first round of reflections. I have a few other seeds I'd like to share as well before we open up our, our question and answer in a little bit. So welcome. I just wanted to say, yeah, I want Jocelyn for that. I, I mean, even just how you were saying that, uh, you know, I, I felt it 
you know, and it, it goes to like a lot what you were saying, you know, and especially in, in my culture, uh, in Haudenosaunee, um, it, we're, we're told, you know, that we're oral people that, you know, we, we tell our stories, it's not written down and even our words and our language. And, you know, it's at times like this where, you know, I'm, uh, you feel like I feel a little shame sometimes because I don't know all of my language uh, anymore um, to where you can really, you know, understand it and feel it. But it's in the wording, you know, that, that's things that you can't necessarily also teach in the English language. Um, you know, what words mean. You don't have, you know, we used to always make jokes growing up uh, when I was in Ganyakeha class. It's, you know, if you wanted a word for fire truck, well, you need, you know, uh, the whole page because it, it's describing it. And being able to say that, it, it's like, exactly how do you teach that um, to, say, Western uh, or colonial um, people? Um, so I, I just wanted to, you know, really say Nyawa for that. That was a truly beautiful story that you had spoken about, um, you know, and it made me realize about, you know, sort of our story with um, Hiawatha and the Peacemaker. Um, and these are just stories that I wish, you know, were out there and people knew about, like we know about you know, antiquity, you know, and all these war heroes and these uh, uh, men who did phenomenal things, but, you know, it, it's not really about that. It's, it's so much more when, when we're talking about uh, stories that are uh, close to home. So uh, just, you know, we'll go again for that. Now we'll go a Cody. I, I, I personally reflect on, I'm working with a student right now who's doing language, uh, revitalization in let's okay and she was speaking a little bit about how when she thinks about the sustainable development goals language enlivens everything all at once uh, she was speaking about that so she was trying to figure out how to speak about that in a way but she was understanding the spirit of that coming from the land and how you know how to speak about that in a way that we really understand the foundation of that and in, in who we are so yeah, now we'll go for presencing that. And I wanted to, um, we have so many, I think, um, Lorna, in some of your work uh, in the Spirit Aligned Leadership, I was looking into the windows of that and they talked about legacy leaders, how we have legacy leaders now that are, you know, as you said, Jessica, creating a pathway for others that have done so much incredible work. And um, Ken, I wanted to ask you and as well, uh, as Bob to reflect on what both researchers and policymakers uh, need to consider when they are engaging and uh, working with traditional knowledge and indigenous peoples, uh, some of the things that they should be uh, be guided by. Because um, I know we have many people here in different sectors who might be asking not only how do I educate myself, but how do I move forward in a good way uh, when we want to center indigenous science and knowledge in our work. Um, well, thanks, Aaron. The thing around Indigenous knowledge, it's, it's one of those concepts that was sort of, the, even the words itself were uh, something that never came from our communities. It was Western scientists that kind of came up with these terminologies. And there seems to be a renewed interest in the Indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge of Indigenous peoples, as you see it written in some of the international uh, goals for the SDG or for the um, Convention of Biological Diversity, the post-2020 framework and things like that. But when you work with this locally, there's a few things that people really have to consider. Um, well, first of all, Indigenous knowledge, a lot of people have this romantic notion of what this is. You know, and there is uh, definitely a role for elders and knowledge keepers on this. But what I try to do is expand people's understanding to understand it as a knowledge system. If we think of it only as knowledge, then from our Western approach, we, that means that we can come in, get that data or information, obtain it, and then it becomes our own. Whereas if you think of it as a knowledge system, it's a way of knowing. There's a methodology behind it. And um, it's a localized methodology. You cannot transfer indigenous knowledge from the Atlantic coast out to the, the Pacific coast, for example. It's, it's embedded in the land. It's embedded in the culture and the traditions. It's, it's embedded within the plant life, the animal life, the fish, 
the birds and all of those creatures that inhabit that, inhabit that land, the type of seasons that occur there, and which also informs our languages. Um, there's also, uh, when you look at some of the uh, ways of going into the digital world of this uh, indigenous knowledge systems, one of the reasons why I call it a knowledge system, it, it also gives that permission, um, so to speak, to uh, allow uh, Indigenous nations, First Nations, to use modern equipment to manage this information. Um, if, if we only think of Indigenous knowledge as something we can acquire, um, then we're not actually living, living the system itself. And there's a problem with... Uh, there's a history, a long history of researchers coming in and get, gathering this knowledge from our communities, from our ancestors, from our elders and knowledge keepers, using that for their own gain, whether it's commercial gain, academic gain, but the benefits don't come back to the communities. There's no acknowledgement back to the communities. And um, community members now are becoming much more hesitant to share. Although I will say that our elders want this information to be shared out because they see what's happening globally with respect to climate change. And they know that if they have some way to make a contribution to mitigate some of the problems that they want to do that. So data sovereignty is really important within a community itself. Um, community protocols on how to engage elders is also very important because elders, they're older, a lot of time they're older people and they, they get tired they have their own routines and their own ways of sharing information. That's really important to work with community members who can actually engage the elders. And um, in some cases, and I'm hoping that this is going to be more prevalent in our communities, that there will actually be protocols in place so that any kind of research that wants to come in and engage our communities will have a set of rules and guidelines on which they can engage. They may not get access to the knowledge keepers directly, there may be intermediaries that are working within the community that will work on the elders' time. They'll work within the language. They'll be able to understand the context of the information shared. Because um, another thing that happens is that knowledge shared from the elders is sometimes not really valued. Um, I guess one of the last things that I just also want to mention is that um, Indigenous knowledge isn't just about what you know. There's an entire value system wrapped around Indigenous knowledge that's embedded, and you can't separate that out. So an example that I use when I talk about this um, in the fisheries world, I've gone to many, um, many meetings where we've had First Nation fishers in a room, and we've had non-Native fishers in a room. And the non-Native fishers will always argue with the scientists that come up and say, this is how much fish is in the water. This is the total allowable catch. Um, and when the, when, when the scientists present this information, they'll often put in a confidence interval, which is a standard science practice. Well, the non-native fishers will always argue and saying, you guys didn't do the surveys the right time of year. Our fishers are seeing different things out there. We want to maximize and push that, um, the quotas to a higher level. Whereas the First Nation fishers, even if they don't understand the science and they don't understand the graphics, they'll say, well, if you have a confidence interval in there, we think we should base it on the lower level of that confidence interval because we want to make sure that there's going to be fish for next year, the year after, and for generations after that. So when we approach science in our Western world, it tends to be to try to maximize economic gain to maximize uh, resource exploitation. But in an indigenous world, even though we do have uh, a need to um, sustain our economies, there's also this built-in value of trying to take a precautionary approach to save some for the next generations. And that's a value system. And, but that's embedded in the indigenous knowledge itself and in the approach. So if, if people can understand that, then they may have an, uh, a better chance of understanding how to approach First Nations communities. Um, also recognize that there are no uh, intellectual property right laws, either nationally within Canada or internationally, because the uh, WIPO is actually working on this to protect Indigenous knowledge. They're, they're, you just can't do it because it's collective knowledge, whereas intellectual property laws are based on property laws, which means that if you come up with an idea, 
then you own that idea and you can profit from it and you own a patent to it or uh, for a limited time. But indigenous knowledge, because it's passed through through generations, it belongs to the nation. So things that I've been taught by elders, like picking sweetgrass, for example, I know how to recognize it within my territory. I know how to harvest it sustainably, but I can't commercialize that. I don't have that permission to do that. There, and there is no loss to protect that that methodology, but there's a responsibility that I have to share that with others. So these are the kind of things that I that I think about when I see people approaching our communities and using Indigenous knowledge as a methodology. Um, Dr. Albert Marshall from Eskasoni is another person that sh could be engaged to talk about the two I'd seen this approach because he and his wife uh, Merdina had actually came up with this concept. The, it's it's a beautiful concept that has proliferated throughout Canadian science anyway, and I think it's even gone in some international recognition, even though people don't really understand the source. But um, this is something that we do try to use in our daily practices. So this is what I'd like to contribute to the discussion. Let me quit you Just done. Uh, oh, sorry. No, welcome, Bob. Please go ahead. I think um, much of what uh, um, what Ken said is is really important and kind of echoed some of the things that that I was thinking about. You know, I I I, I worry about you know even words like thinking about models versus um, systems and 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 that idea within systems there's both uh, context and content and how difficult it is to um, replicate context sometimes and thinking about sort of the way, the role of ceremony in terms of both gathering uh, knowledge and passing on knowledge. I know for myself, there's different things I've been gifted with in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of harvesting rights. And, um, and for some of them, <clears throat> The, uh, and this was with um, uh, some of my Anishinaabe uh, brothers and sisters, a uh, very strict law in terms of what I could do with what I've been given. So there was certain plants, for example, <clears throat> that I may have had responsibility for and maybe even some um, authority to pick but it didn't mean I had the authority to pass on that authority. Or um, even in picking that, there was certain restrictions in terms of how I could use that. And oftentimes it's in terms of, I think understanding in indigenous knowledge, thinking about these protocols and values and laws and rights that underscore all of that are oftentimes difficult to, to pass on. The relationship between the individual in terms of perhaps being a holder of or a carrier of uh, particular knowledge and the rights of the community in terms of, of knowledge I, it is something that I think oftentimes we, we don't spend a lot of time on, but it's something that's, that's really, really critical, um, especially given how um, so many of our elders and knowledge keepers are being sought out in terms of you know, people wanting to uh, interview them, research them in order to produce their thesis or their dissertation. And, um, and then what, what does that mean in terms of, of the person that did that writing? What does that mean in terms of how they can use that, that knowledge? Um, and what does that mean in terms of their relationship with the person that gave them that knowledge? I think are, are things we're all starting to sort through because we have, we have um, things like OCAP and other ethical frameworks that help us you know, think through these things. But um, there's, there's also these sort of on the ground situations that are often hard to think through. Like what's the, what's the ethical question that needs to be considered and needs to be answered in terms of how information is being sought 
and then later what's being done with that, uh, that information. Um, the government of Canada right now, and many governments across the country have huge amounts of Indigenous data. And what, what does that mean in terms of Indigenous data sovereignty? And the implementation, I think, as one of the other speakers talked about, of the United Nations uh, uh, rights of Indigenous people. And, and how are we going to put those protocols in place? And I know in some cases, like an engineering firm might be working with the community, and it's almost like a two key lock system. Like the engineering firm can't open the box without the indigenous uh, key also being part of that. So although they might have that knowledge, how they use it is really up to the indigenous knowledge holder and how that, that, that shared. So I think there's you know some models out there that are evolving that are really helpful, um, but you know going back to what what you're asking too in terms of uh, of sort of approach like I I just think there's just such a huge role for humility uh, in terms of um, a principle or a foundation in uh, in that relationship between the researcher or the one seeking understanding and indigenous knowledge holders. And how does humility um, uh, play a role in terms of how knowledge is gathered, how knowledge is shared, uh, knowledge ownership, um, and, and all of those things, um, I, I think is really critical. I can just see the need for, as we're, we're moving through this and combining you know, digital technologies in the digital world with indigenous knowledge with you know, trying to make a more sustainable world for all of us, and in particular for those coming faces of this strong indigenous ethical framework to be able to, uh, to sort through some of these really tough questions. And then all of it sort of being focused back to, as many of us talked about, uh, how is this good for our children? And how is this good for those, those, those coming faces? And that being a significant lens for us to be looking through. Now, which? Now I'll go on me, which? Um, I, it actually, uh, so much of what you said it reflects a little bit of some of the thought exchange, uh, some of the questions in the thought exchange that went out um, sort of to the larger community as they began to ex engage the town halls and, and really asking, you know, how can sustainability science or researchers actively support uh, what Indigenous peoples are working on? And you know, I feel like the depth of uh, all of our reflections here, um, from the from our opening all the way to this moment, you know, reflects on that question. Um, but some of it here is is about how. I think it's it's right at the center as as we center you know indigenous knowledge systems uh, today is you know how how are indigenous peoples involved at every step of the process. Um, instead of you know different aspects of consultation so there was a reflection back on how that can be done well and um and some of the uh some of the work that i know uh lorna your students are here today and so there's a lot around indigenous scholarship you know all the way through we talked about the nature of education itself and uh, how we can move that resource allocation and continue to cultivate that uh, from from the way that we relate to gathering knowledge. Um, so we did have a little bit of a reflection back, but I just wanted to say thank you to our panel so far, our circle, because I do feel we've really looked at that and our, our larger community um, was really looking at the question of actually how do we continue to center um, people and, and continue to provide resources to build uh, know to build the leadership capacity I know Jocelyn you were talking about that you know really building up um, experience and uh, and how we are and our values in the ways that we come in relationship and continue to learn together so there was a lot of reflection back uh, from the community but the one that kept centering was around the decol decolonization of knowledge through centering indigenous peoples uh, the voice and vision uh, so that it can provide uh, and light a pathway forward for us we just wanted to take a moment to presence that in our community uh, that's here. I know we have a lot more uh, questions that 
I think are seeds that we're all carrying here. And we wanted to uh, welcome Lorna. We're grateful that you could make time. We know that you were teaching during this time. So it's a really a special honor to have uh, one of your students be able to be with us to kind of open up our question and answer um, process. Um, and we have some more some more questions here. So we wanted to welcome in Simon Bird. Um, I think we have a spotlight uh, for him to come in and open up a window um, to share our first uh, question uh, to our circle of panelists. Welcome, Simon. Answer. Give the thumbs up now, Al. I'm from uh, northern Saskatchewan, uh, Nadoc, that's the Nesky Nock, the uh, home of the Rock Cree people. And uh, I'm coming to you from my home here uh, recently in the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people in uh, Ottawa. I'd show you more, more of my home, very traditional. My, my mattress is on, the, is on the floor. That's the kind of traditional. Uh, First Nations person I am, but my question, you know, it, it feels, it feels somewhat uh, like it's already been answered by our panel. Uh, I mean, the very, very uh, in-depth conversation, but at the same time, it's it, this 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 point of 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 trust, of exploit exploitation, even uh, uh, what Ken Paul was talking about in terms of indigenous knowledge. Uh, versus ways of knowing <clears throat> starts to really dig deeper at this question that I, I initially was going to ask, but this is for Dr. Lorna. You know, um, every generation is asking this question, and I, uh, in some ways, it's becoming more urgent with, you know, our, our uh, uh, with our indigenous languages being lost. You know, I, I, you know, where we're seeing that there's a direct correlation between indigenous languages and our ways of knowing in you know, indigenous knowledge. So with that said, should indigenous people share their knowledge with the outside world for fear of it being exploited? And, uh, you know, based around exploitation and trust. I'd love to hear uh, from, from Lorna and anybody else. Hmm. Well, Lorna, I think it's still on mute there. Just welcome you. Thank you for your question, Simon. I forgot, thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, that's been touched on a little bit by a number of the panelists. Um, but it's um, it's very real, and um, an example that I always use is that here in British Columbia, a number of um, academics, for example, um, documented and recorded and used for their dissertations and for their academic writing the stories told in the communities and the teaching stories, because that's how we learn. And, um, and then what happened is that um, the communities lost access to those stories. And those stories then became owned by the person who collected them. And that's very, re so it's very real. The, you know, the, the trust issue, because there are no um, um, structures in place that protect that that protect the knowledge systems of the indigenous peoples in the communities, that's um, and so we need to be very careful and cautious, and um, you know, and in and that's becoming extremely. Um, important today in the in, with the digital world with so much you know um being just released out and um we need to be able to create the structures to support our knowledge systems and we need to be particip full participants in this 
And when we think about, you know, how do we come to know as indigenous people on our homelands? We come to know from a long, long, long system of, um, of people, you know, passing on their knowledge from one generation to another. It comes from a long, long, long system of learning from the learning from the land itself. And I remember one time I was talking to a group um, of government employees in education here in BC. And I, I was broaching the topic of how we come to know. And, um, um, and I was saying, you know, we know what plants to use for as medicine, how to use them, what to use, because the plants tell us. Now the, to think about that idea is really, really hard for other, you know, for other groups of people. I don't think that it's unique to us, but it is. It's, you know, we learn because we're taught by the land, we're taught by the planets, we're done plants. We're taught by our ancestors. Our ancestors continue to tell us and to share with us. And, and so our way of coming to know is, um, is so multifaceted and it doesn't come, uh, and it has to come, you know, uh, to us with a sense of, um, of care, a sense of reciprocity, a sense of responsibility. And, um, and so, you know, to just release it to, to out there to be used and abused is irresponsible on our part. And so we need to, to address this collectively and, um, individually and communally. And um, so I'm really happy that you raised this, Simon. It's, um, you know, with, um, with this whole, um, you know, the creation of, for example, of artificial intelligence in which uh, machines are awarded, you know, this, uh, the knowledge systems, um, that's going to, it's going to be more and more a part of um, what we need to really pay attention to. And I'd like other people to help help with this question. Thanks. Please go ahead, Ken. Um, thanks, Dr. Lorna. That's really important what you shared there. Um, Simon, when I worked with my elders, there's specifically uh, Gwen Bear has been very influential on, upon me from my home community. She's passed on into the spirit world around eight years ago now, but she really taught me and uh, made me understand that uh, I should not act, um, do, make my actions based on fear. So fearing that we're going to lose our stories, we're going to lose our knowledge, we lose our language, and doing something on that behalf is um, like, we, if we do that because fear is a negative emotion, uh, we probably in the short term or long term have negative results. And so what she has taught me is to act upon love and upon truth. And so sharing information out um, I think is important to do because uh, we need to figure out ways to mitigate what is happening to our mother earth. And it's not that um, we're saving the planet. We're actually saving ourselves. And I think a lot of people are kind of starting to understand this now. So, uh, but also as Dr. Lorna says, we also have a responsibility and, you know, I'm kind of reflecting upon this as, as you know, as you've asked this question, and I think about okay, well, if we're working with a child um, and we're teaching a child like how to prepare breakfast, for example, 
we wouldn't show that child like how to crack eggs, how to cut bacon and do all of these things that are dangerous. You may only teach that child how to pull a bowl of cereal, something simple. So, um, so we share the information for the individual at the level that they're prepared to accept it. So sharing knowledge out, I think that we can do that. And coming back to the point I made about protocols, there should be a methodology towards sharing things out, which also gives a responsibility to the person that's receiving that information, responsibility back to our nation, but also only share out the things that they actually need. I don't think that we should be sharing with them all the information coming from our elders. I think that would be better served if we had individuals within the communities that could work with our elders, but those individuals can be intermediaries to work with the proponents to share specifically the information that proponent needs to complete their work. And all of the other information that's shared then becomes part of this tradition of sharing it within our nation. And um, again, coming back to this knowledge system, that then it becomes the responsibility of the nation to manage that data, manage that information. And we might want to do that formally using geographic information systems, uh, record, uh, video recording equipment, um, but also we have that ability when our two wide scene approach to match that data up with Western science, maybe bring in a satellite imagery, using technology such as drones to do ground truthing and all those other things, because as we are trying to rebuild our nations and reestablish ourselves as nations, we have to use the tools available for us to uh, rebuild um, our ability to manage our lands, our waters, and to work with our, uh, our relatives in the plant world, the water world, and you know the air world. So that's 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 what I think about when you had mentioned that uh, asked that question. Thank you very much. Can I ask Ms. Noah? Mm. Thank you, Simon. If there's uh, if there's any further reflections, I can continue. Maybe we have time for one more question. I, it's amazing how uh, when we talk about time and space, uh, how things move along, and it is also a reflection of why we gathered for a few days when we started to open something up um, so that everything could be heard. Uh, but we're grateful to have this time with everyone. One of the questions, um, I think it was midstream that has come through, was around some of the maybe a wise practices or an example. I think sometimes people say a bright spot, um, whether when it, whether it's uh, you know the the use of digital uh, technology and indigenous science and knowledge, um, as you mentioned, uh, Ken, to support some of our work or. Uh, if it's uh, within the research uh, community, um, I see your hand up, Jessica. Did you want to respond? Yeah, please go ahead. So coming from um, a non-scientist background, <laughs> I, I want to speak to that as well as another question that I had read that was lower in the, um, the Q&A. Um, I guess the understanding that the differences between Indigenous knowledge and Western science are not always existing. And by this, I mean, um, I guess I'm alluding to what was said earlier about Indigenous knowledge, not just being knowledge, but more of a network. And in my experience, um, I have a policy background. So a lot of what I understand about policy relates to the fact that the way that we had moved about in this world and our ways of doing things was our policy. That was the way that we approach things. Our values was our policy. So there was no written, I guess, framework for how we were going about this world. So when it comes to, I guess, science and digitization, my perspective is that we are taking ownership of this and of the relationship that we have with knowledge. And for the digital world, we will do the same. We will listen to our hearts and our spirits as Jocelyn had mentioned earlier, and we move forward ensuring that we are being responsible and respectful with all the information that is shared. And as for, um, an example of using science and Indigenous knowledge is, I guess, for a political position, you would negotiate, you know, um, 
I guess, environmental assessments in a way where we had our traditional practices on these lands and that we, um, we would use those geographical equipment. I'm sorry, I'm really not a science background. <laughs> those geographical equi equipment in order to support our knowledge in order to show them exactly where we were, the satellite maps and all the medicines that are in the ground that they understand as they're like as a different kind of medicine and how we relate to the waters and how we relate to the wildlife in that area because a lot of our traditional practices are very much incorporated in our our knowledge and our our science of our cultures. So that's that's kind of an example that I can give is that it may not the difference between the two may not always exist because if we're using these um, technologies, that is part of our indigenous knowledge because we're using it in the way and we're taking ownership of that to move forward in order to, yeah, in order to move forward. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. <laughs> Uh, it was very clear. Now we'll go, uh, Jessica. Thank you for, you know, listening into that question and and starting to shine the light on some of the, the different ways. I know um, Ken, I haven't had the opportunity to sit with Albert Marshall, but I've listened into a lot of the work around two-eyed seeing, and sometimes he would say, you know, if we're not grounded in indigenous, you know, ways of being or knowing, and we start to talk about two-eyed seeing, then it, you know, it's not. In harmony or it's not the technology is it moving out from that center and I think Jessica you spoke about that well about being in the spirit of interdependency of you know when we think about two eyed seeing is that we're grounded in our places and we're you know moving um, our knowledge forward out from that as opposed to starting with technology and trying to uh, bring things in and I know there's a lot of people thinking about how do we do that well and what do we need to think about and we started to we started to start to touch, I think, the pulse of uh, many of these questions. Um, but I would like to maybe just give a few moments for everyone to say any closing words as we come in. It's uh, we're just coming to the close of uh, of our time here together. And I know Eliane as well will share a few words. So I'll just take us around the circle. Jocelyn, um, you're next to me, uh, followed by Ken and then Bob. Thank you, Glynis Chief Aaron, and just uh, Glynis Chief to all the panel members and the participants for, for listening and sharing as we explore these important and, and big questions. And uh, yeah, it was really enjoyable to listen to everybody and to learn. And, and, and just one thing that I really appreciate about being Indigenous in, in Canada and, and on Earth is uh, the solidarity. Um, there's always such a comfort in reaching, you know, to the other side of the country and know that we're essentially fighting the same fight, but then also coming with the same foundations and, and virtues and strength and knowing um, to, to push back or push forward. And um, it's just really, a, it's just so exciting. <laughs> I feel really energized and, and optimistic and, and my hope is always just so high. Um, so I, I really look forward to, to what's to come. Thank you. Great, Jocelyn. Welcome, Ken. Well, I, I guess what I would say is I feel very honored to be asked to participate in this forum. I There are very strong spirits that are part of this panel, and uh, I don't, I, I'm not sure who the who the audience is. I know there's a number of attendees on here. I'm hoping that our messages come off positively. Um, basically what I think we are doing, we're, we're talking about healing everything that this is the lens that I'm hearing when I hear the stories that are being shared here and talking about healing ourselves, healing our communities, healing our nation. And, um, the positive things about sharing as well is really, really important. Um, the only, the last thing that I would mention though, uh, with respect to all of this, and this is a principle that I have adopted many moons ago, was that in order to facilitate the healing, whether you're part of an indigenous nation or part of mainstream society, one of the things that we can do is empower our women. We live, I feel like, well, I know we live in a hyper-masculine society in general. And 
if it's so the voice that our ma our masculine voice really takes up too much space and part of the healing and part of the balance has to be empowering our women they are leaders as much as everybody else um they actually in my my communities and with the people that i work with in my uh first nation communities they tend to have the longer term vision as well so it's just that for a whole bunch of different reasons, those voices are suppressed. So if we can do more of that and actually listen to the grandmothers, the mothers, the daughters, the aunts, I think that we will have a, uh, a more positive outcome towards the work that we're trying to do. So I would just say that. So just uh, also want to say what an honor it's been to share space and time with uh, uh, my co-panelists um, and with all of you that are joining in. Um, I guess my kind of reflection on this really goes back to some of our origin stories, which really puts humankind at a place of total dependency on those other orders of uh, creation just to be able to survive and to live and how those other orders of creation taught us how to live on you know, what we call Turtle Island. And that communication was there like Dr. Lorna talked about. And um, that, that notion that how dependent we are, we always have been on those other orders of uh, creation for us to be able to survive. And they can, you know, we're taught, they can do really well without us. The mineral world, the plant world, the world of animals, and maybe do way better without us, but they tolerate us nevertheless. And that's, there's a teaching in that all by itself, I think, in terms of our relationship. We've heard reciprocity and humility, um, uh, stewardship, kindness, love of the land. And, and so I just invite people to think about how that idea of love of the land, uh, one of my elders, I was asking her, um, like, what, what would be the hallmark of reconciliation? And she said, when non-Indigenous people love the land as much as we do, that's reconciliation. And I, I just, I really like that. So I just offer that out there as a reflection. Miigwech and Yahweh for this, uh, this opportunity. Welcome uh, you, Cody, and uh, then we'll have Dr. Lorna. Uh, yeah, well, for um, inviting me to this. Uh, I apologize, I can't make it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, the schedules are hectic. Uh, the elections had just happened, so we're trying to get caught up with a lot of different things. Uh, really inspired uh, by all the panelists and all the words. Um, I wish, you know, we, we had longer. I'm sure we can spend uh, hours, you know, just going around. Uh, but, you know, life, life happens. I uh, just wanted to follow up, you know, and uh, Ken had just said some, uh, some really good words there. Uh, you know, and in, in my culture, for uh, the Iroquois, for the Haudenosaunee, you know, women set the direction, you know, and men carry out that direction. You know, it was talked about how, you know, right now it's sort of a, patriarchal world uh, or western world was bent like you know more designed along you know men were the leaders but uh you know we, we say mother earth for a reason we don't say father earth you know women are the life givers and they're going to show us the way and and i really do believe it lies with women uh, and we can see that you know in in the recent uh you know years especially in ganawage uh, having uh, our first female grand chief um, as well, the Attorney General, the first woman Attorney General uh, for Canada. You know, I, I do think this is a, a turning point, um, you know, and just going forward, it's, you know, we are at a junction, the planet, uh, the writing is sort of on the wall. Uh, but uh, for me, I think the answer, I know the answer is with uh, Indigenous people. You know, we've, we've shown the way before, we've lived the way before, uh, and, and it's time to, um, you know, sort of go back to that. I never like to say go back, but, but reinstate it, uh, you know, with that harmony between the earth, 
humans, we, we all have a role to play. We're not outside of that system. We're, we're part of that system. And, and we need to, I wanna say learn our place again, but essentially learn our place that we're not uh, better than anything else on this planet. And uh, if we want the planet to survive, we need to get back to uh, our roots. So Miao Goa, and uh, I wish everybody safe during these times. It's, thank you very much. It's been a real, um, a real honor for me to participate with this, and I want to thank the organizers for, or you know, for inviting me. And um, and Aaron, thank you for guiding us through this and keeping us on track. And um, and I'm really happy that um, that there was a real diversity of voices in in every way and i would just like to end by saying that um you know as we're entering as we're in being part now of this new kind of um form of our world of the digital world um you know it's a world that uh, i don't really understand um I, I've been you trying to use it, but you know it's something that I struggle to learn about. And when we talk about equity, I, you know, I would really like us to participate in this with that with a real sense of striving for equity. because even right now, in, when I look across our country, that, um, it's inequitable. The access to digital to the digital world is inequitable. There are many parts, many you know, in my community. I'm, um, you know, not that far from a large urban center, and yet there are parts of my community that cannot, where the people cannot access the digital world, and they have, you know, they have to go somewhere else to be able to do that. And there are places where they, they can even get access. And um, we need to be able to think about that. We also need to be able to think about um, the inequity that's been established because, because um, it's been guided by a very um, Latin language oriented system. And um, and and yet, you know, like it's yet again, our languages are not being recognized and acknowledged, and we have don't have the capacity to use our languages. And um, our languages are the house on in which our knowledge systems reside. And there are just so many beautiful, beautiful understandings of the world that we um, that we can access when we when we consider, you know, the concepts that are in our language, and um, and it's only through, you know, the really um, delving into those. Con into the into those un multi multiple understandings of concepts, the deep understandings of con those concepts, that we that we can begin to really um, know our world, and uh, you know, so it's it's a real important tool. And the last thing I would like to say is that um, Aaron, you mentioned you brought up the Spirit Aligned uh, Legacy Project. And that project was born on the lands of the Akwesasne in um, on the New York side. Um, but what it's focusing on is um, is mentoring. It's focusing on the mentorship between from from elder woman to younger woman. And it's so you know what you talked about, Ken and Cody. Um, about the role, uh, you know, the importance of the role of woman, I think is really key. And, it, and so somebody is doing something about it. And, um, and so that because we need to create and to have those opportunities, and it's not just for, for women, we're beginning, you know, this is beginning with women, 
we need it for we need to be able to actively mentor the the next generations and to create the to create the tools and the structures within our communities to be able to do that and to mentor and to mentor from one generation to the next you know to prepare for to prepare in all very the many areas that we need in and um, and so I'm really encouraging people to be able to do that because you know what exists today um, the tool the tools that exist kind of like in the in the world beyond our communities uh, hasn't provided those opportunities for us to to really hold on to and carry and learn from the wisdom of the the generations from before us and the generate and the next generations are really need that knowledge we need that knowledge so thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to have a voice and in, in on the on these top and these huge topics kukshokala Miigwech, Lorna. I'm so grateful, uh, so honored to be here. Um, Jessica, please uh, welcome your words. And then Eliane, I will welcome you as well, um, if you're with us here, to turn on your, your video. I just want to say nyamago for everybody for being here and providing all of the energy and spirit that you guys carry with yourselves each and every day. And again, thank you. I want to reiterate what uh, Lorna had shared. Thank you, Erin, for pulling us in together because, you know, we can we probably tell stories till the, the cows come home. <laughs> we could be here all day just telling our stories. Um, I just, I hope that um, everyone had felt some good feelings from the discussions today. And I'm really glad to see us all come to one mind within our, our panelists and to have really important dialogue on a really important issue. And Nyawa for the organizers for creating that space for this kind of dialogue to at least happen and definitely need more than two hours for <laughs> these kind of conversations. And I'm so honored to be amongst all of you and all of your great minds and your great spirits that you carry with you again. So Nyawa Goa Sewakwego. I wish you all well, and I wish you all a good rest of your afternoon. Welcome, Eliane. So I, I, my heart is so full. I just want to thank all the speakers, all the participants, uh, all the sharing. This has been a really powerful space. Uh, in Kenya, Rwanda, um, yesterday and tomorrow are the same word, and they mean ejo. And it's how you conjugate the verb that determines whether you're talking about yesterday or tomorrow. And it really, for me, is the linking of our ancestors and the generations to come. And this conversation has really been about navigating the past, the present, and the future, and healing and collectively healing the hurts that we have all felt, that Mother Earth has felt. And I am so deeply appreciated of all the wisdom that has been shared today and just thank you and also thank you on behalf of my daughter who's 17 and who wrote the song on when she was 15 um this idea of how we think about the generations and i think of my mother who who has passed on and how she's smiling and her mother is are, they're all smiling and just thank all of you for the gift of your time and knowledge and for your ancestors and for all they have given us so thank you very much Thank you, Eliane, for your leadership. Murdad, would you like to share as we come into close? Uh, Erin, uh, thank you. I, no, I was not supposed actually to say words. And I uh, and if you, uh, I really appreciate all the comments. I was here to there to learn. And I learned so much from different perspectives of uh, indigenous nations and uh, the issues with, from different perspectives, different parts of the country. I really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to learn more and we collectively act on those. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Murdad. And I, um, 
sometimes there's no words to express the gratitude of being um, invited into a space, um, especially I remember as a young person coming out of university not knowing how to live um, in the world today based on the systems. When you talked about we matter and the spirit of life promotion and creating pathways together, I, I can remember being at a critical juncture of not knowing how to live. and. The generosity of this uh, circle, um, the, the brilliance of the pathways that are being lit, uh, both from an interpersonal healing to a collective uh, leadership is incredibly powerful. So I just want to thank you uh, from, I would say, you know, from that, that deeper part of myself who continues to ask, you know, how to walk in a good way. Thank you for taking the time to be with us and uh, Lorna for all of your students and for this greater community that's here. Um, that we didn't get to all of your questions, but we say when you when you speak your questions, when they go out, you know what you need will start to come in, and we trust that uh, that we might not have got to all of the questions that you might start to follow them, and that your answers will will come. Uh, a song uh, that I wanted to share um, as we as we leave uh, to transition is a song from the women of Wata. Um, they live very close to me. It's a community. Uh, an incredible community that continues to move forward in the ways that we've been speaking to and I've had the opportunity to work with them and uh, this shares the song is called the Ganahia it's uh, Jessica you might be able to know a little bit more but they would talk a lot about the good seeds and a lot of what we carried about the seeds of, of what we're sharing here today from our ancestors all the ones that have come before all of the life all of our relatives into this moment to the ones that are coming. So they t it's a song about caring for those good seeds. And so I wanted to, uh, to, to send a traveling song and, and a song for our ancestors and all of the spirit of knowledge that we all carry collectively um, as we close our time together. So Chimi Gwich. Miigwech and thank you everyone for sharing a little bit of extra time as we talk about time and space but I'm grateful that we could uh, continue to close in the way that we do. Miigwech. Mm -hmm.